As one last example of uncertainty propagation, error analysis, I'm going to follow up on my last example and do a follow-up example that's going to illustrate a common pitfall that you can run into in doing uncertainty propagation, and after that, show you how to fix that problem by doing uh, some more complicated equations using partial derivatives to make everything work out properly. Uh, what I want to do is start out by reviewing my previous example. So in the previous example, I had a mass circling around a fixed axis attached to a rigid rod, and I had figured out what its linear momentum was, the magnitude of its linear momentum. I had these measurements for the period, the radius, and the mass, and then I just said, okay, linear momentum is mv, and v, the speed, is circumference over time. Circumference is 2 pi r. In that previous example, I had gone through and propagated through the uncertainty in all those steps and found my linear, linear momentum was 10.05 kilogram meters per second, plus or minus 1.51 kilogram meters per second. That's 15.0 percent. I've kept an extra digit all throughout here because these are intermediate steps now. I'm going on to another step. So my next question is, okay, I found the linear momentum. What's the angular momentum of this mass moving around its axis? Well, that's a simple enough question. I know that L, angular momentum, is R cross product with P, radius vector cross product with the momentum vector. And since this is a circular motion, those are automatically perpendicular. That means that the magnitude L is just the product of those two magnitudes, R times P. So I can work this out. That tells me that L equals uh, my radius, 2.4 meters, times my momentum, which was 10.05 kilogram meters per second, uh, and that came out to be 24.12 kilogram meters squared per second. Okay, so that's my value for L, my base value for L. Now I want to know what's the uncertainty in L. And this is the part where I'm going to put up a warning, because I'm about to do something that is wrong. I want you to keep your eyes open and see if you can spot what my mistake is, what I'm doing wrong here. So I want to find the uncertainty in L. That means uh, this is a product, R times P is a product, so I have, to, uh, I have to use relative uncertainties, relative errors for those. Uh, so the relative uncertainty, delta L over L, is going to be, and our standard rule for products is adding in quadrature, so square root of delta R over R squared plus delta P over P squared. Uh, what's that give me? That gives me um, my delta R over R. Uh, delta R over R was my 12.5% squared plus this I just said was 15.0%. 15.0% squared. And when I work that out, uh, the result I, find up, I, I wind up getting is this is plus or minus, let's see, adding those in quadrature gives me about 19.5% uh, as my uncertainty. Uh, so my relative uncertainty is 19.5%, uh, which means then that delta L would be equal to, um, what did I get for that? I don't want to do calculator math in front of you, 4.72. Uh, 4.72 kilogram meter squared per second. This is multiplying almost 20% by this 24 uh, kilogram meter squared per second. That's what I come up with. Okay, so that seems to be the obvious way of doing this, and as I said, it is dead wrong. Why is it dead wrong? What's wrong about this? Remember, we added in quadrature here. Adding in quadrature is what we do when we have independent random normally distributed errors. Uh, that's the usual thing. Here's the trick. Delta R over R and delta P over P are not independent uncertainties. The uncertainty in R also factored in to the, un to the uncertainty in P. That R plays, played into calcul the calculation of P by itself before we brought it in here as well. The issue that we run into is that if I were to write out this equation in full, the r times p, just plug all this stuff together, um, v was 2 pi r over t, 
M P is uh, P there is M times 2 pi R over T. So L equals R times M times 2 pi R over T. In other words, 2 pi m r squared over t. And there we can see what the problem is. There's an r squared once we actually write this out. The radius squared. That means that the uncertainty in r is actually, it, it, we can't add in quadrature because this is a worst, because this is a worst case scenario. If r is a little bit too big, we can't expect it'll fluctuate too big in this part of the equation, fluctuate too, that, too small in that part of the equation, and cancel out. This is always a worst case sub scenario. It's always something where those two will fluctuate in tandem. That means that adding in quadrature vastly underestimates the cost of uncertainties in R. Instead, well, there are a couple of, a couple of approaches we could take. One thing we could do is to go through our whole process of building this product up out of independent p out of component pieces. So we could do what's the uncertainty in R squared, uh, and then find and what, what's the value and uncertainty there, and then propagate by multiplying by m and dividing by t, and then multiply by two pi. We can do that. Instead, though, I want to take this opportunity to talk a little bit about how you can use partial derivatives to do this sort of automatically. Once you have an expression here uh, for L in terms of the actual measured variables, if you've written your final quantity that you're interested in, in terms of only the variables you have original measurements for, original uncertainty measurements for, then a completely reliable, and in fact, a completely reliable way of finding the uncertainty in L, and in fact, the source of its uh, original thing, uh, of the rules that we've come up with here, is the following formula. It says that the uncertainty in L is equal to, adding in quadrature, the partial derivative of L with respect to the first variable, um, t, I guess, times delta t squared, plus the partial derivative of L with respect to the second variable, squared, times delta r squared, plus, still under the square root, sorry, this got squeezed, the partial derivative of L with respect to the last variable, dl dm squared, times the uncertainty in m squared. That's all under my square root sign. So I'm adding in quadrature, these pieces that are all partial, that's a partial squared, forgot my squared, partial squared times this squared, and these are absolute uncertainties in this case. So that means I need to know the partial derivatives for all these things. I've got my equation here, let me work out those partials. Um, dl dt is going to be, um, that's t in the denominator, those are all constants with respect to t, so negative 2 pi m r squared over t squared. And just for convenience, I'm going to write this as comparing that to L. That looks like that's negative L over t. Okay? dL dr is next is equal to, well, it's an r squared. That means this is 4 pi m r divided by t. In other words, that's 2, uh, yeah, 2 L over R. Again, I'm writing in terms of L for future convenience. And finally, my partial derivative of L with respect to M is the easiest of all. That's just M to the first. So it is 2 pi R squared over T, or I could write this as L over M. Okay, I've written all these pieces. I've got all these together. I've got my partial derivatives. I also know my uh, uncertainties. Now I can plug this in. Uh, if you really wanted to, you could just do this. You could just plug in the numbers into this equation. But I want to write something else down to just, I, I want to do this symbolically one more step to be a bit more, uh, a bit more sneaky about this. So I'm, I'm going to keep this written up here. Sorry, I'm running out of board space. Um, I'm going to keep this part over here. And I'm going to write down this quadrature equation that with partials. I'm going to plug in these forms in terms of L, just to see where that takes us. Um, this tells me that my uncertainty in L, delta L, is equal to the square root of, okay, dl dt, that is minus L over T squared times delta T squared, plus dl dr is 2L over R squared times 
delta r squared plus, can I do this, l over m squared times delta m squared. Okay, I'm invading the next column a little bit, but you get the idea. There's my square root. All right, I've got this. Those are my pieces. <clears throat> if you look at this, all these terms have an l squared in them. I can factor that out. This is l times the square root of, and then I can combine these a little. Okay, the negative squared is just positive. And so this turns into delta t over t squared plus, I factor out the l, 2 squared is 4. 4 times delta r over r squared plus delta m over m squared. And suddenly, let's look at this for a second. L times this, this just means that the relative uncertainty in L is equal to this sum in quadrature of these terms. It looks almost like a normal sum in quadrature. In particular, the t and the m parts of it are a normal sum in quadrature. But look at this part in the middle. That's very close to it, but there's a factor of 4 out front. The 4 came from the 2 squared. That's the effect of the squared term on the r playing in here. The squared term gives us a 4 there. Uh, if I had just added in quadrature earlier, like I did uh, naively, I would have gotten just two factors of delta o, r over r, not four factors of delta r over r under the square root sign. That's essentially what the, what the mistake was earlier. It vastly underestimates this square, the effect of the squared term. So with that, I can actually work this out. That tells me that delta L over L equals the square root of all these relative uncertainties. I would worked out that this one was 6.67% squared plus 4 times 12.5% squared plus this one was 5% squared. That's my actual square root for this relative uncertainty, delta L over L. And when I work all that out, I get that this equals, when I work it out, 26.4% uh, 26 that's a much higher uncertainty than I had last time. My previous wrong calculation to come up with 19% uncertainty. This is 26% uncertainty. So my final result that I want to report is then that my angular momentum L is equal to, and I could work this out, it's equal to, oh, I guess I should say here that delta L then, when I multiply 26.4% times L, 24.12, my actual delta L turns out to be uh, 6.4 kilogram meter squared per second. So rounding to one sig fig, because, I, because that's an uncertainty and it doesn't start with one or a two, uh, L ends up being 24 kilogram meter squared per second, plus or minus 6 kilogram meter squared per second. And that's the answer I really wanted in the end. That's the answer I come up with. The 24 or the 26 percent uncertainty instead of the 19 percent uncertainty is a pretty big difference. Ultimately, this came down to the fact that the, the essential issue was that the two things I was multiplying had correlated uncertainties. They were not independent uncertainties, and so I needed to be more careful about how I combined them. I like the partial derivative method here because it's very general. If you ever have a function written in terms of the measured variables, you can just do this and you're done. But I could have propagated the uncertainty through from that step if I wanted to. The only thing I can't do is propagate through from a derived result if I'm combining with something else that has the same dependence, that is the same that whose uncertainty has already been incorporated. I need to be careful about those. So that's my story. That's how you can find uncertainties in a general equation even when the pieces that go into it are, are not independent. You just go back to the base variables and use some partial derivative rules to come up with the correct sum and quadrature of your uncertainties.